we just finished thermodynamics, and in thermodynamics, you looked at does a reaction occur. So the way you did that is you looked at the sign of the Gibbs. If you had a negative Gibbs, the reaction occurred. It was product favored, so you went from reactants to products. If you had a positive Gibbs, then you had a reactant favored reaction. That means the products turned back into reactants. And if Gibbs was zero, we're at equilibrium. But thermodynamics didn't tell us anything about how fast something was going to happen. It just said, eventually, at some point in time, at some rate, this reaction will occur. Kinetics is going to tell us how fast a reaction is going to occur, and it'll also tell us how the reactants are involved in this reaction. It's going to tell us um, if reactants are going to show up multiple times, in which order reactants will collide. This reactant will collide with this reactant first, and then go and collide with itself one more time. It'll actually give us the steps. It'll tell us the mechanism. The mechanism is just like in Hess's law when you had first step, second step, third step, and it would add up to the overall reaction. That is the mechanism. And what's special about the mechanism is, well, we know what reactants we had because we're the ones that mixed them, and we have all the time in the world to figure out what the products are because they're nice and stable, but we can't see what happens during those steps. So how do we know? How do we know the order of the reactants reacting? When, when I tell you that there's step one and then step two and then step three, how do you know what's actually happening? The way you figure it out, you study kinetics. So we're going to look at how we vary concentrations to figure out how those concentrations of reactants affect the speed of uh, reaction. So first of all, what is a reaction? For that, we have to look at collision theory. Collision theory has has um, three parts. The first part is that two particles must collide in order to react. That makes sense. They have to come in touch and contact. And those collisions have to be strong enough to overcome activation energy. So you can think about two particles, maybe a hydrogen molecule and an oxygen molecule. They're going to react. First, they have to collide hard enough to break their initial bonds, and then they're actually going to react and form new bonds. And the third one is that collisions have to have the right orientation. So they have to actually collide in a way that they could react. That's going to matter more when you have large molecules where, let's imagine we have this large molecule where only one part is reactive, and then this little guy. The only way, let's say this thing is only reactive right here, the only way you could have a collision that would react would be if the particle goes there. So, can't go anywhere else, whoops, that would not result in a reaction, neither would that anywhere else. So they have to collide, they have to collide hard enough, and they have to have the right orientation. So we measure reaction rate by seeing what the change in concentration is of a reactant or of a product with time. So what you can do is you can run a reaction, and let's say we have a reaction where we can actually see what the concentration is of the reaction, and if you can see it, imagine it's a colored solution and you can measure the concentration of a colored solution, then you can see what the concentration is going to be with time. And you can see that at first it's changing quickly. And as reactants run out, there's fewer collisions, so the reaction's happening more slowly. So the way we measure rate is we want to know the change in concentration over the change in time. And there's a few different ways you can measure rate. There's the initial, the average, and the instantaneous. The initial rate is going to be right at the beginning. So when you very first start, with the, reactants that, the concentration of the reactants that you started with, what is your initial rate? So you would have this small triangle right here at the very beginning. And you're going to say, what's my change in concentration over my change in time? So rise over run will give me the slope of that line. And it's going to tell me what my, what my rate is in the very beginning. Initial rates are nice because you know the concentration of the reactants that you mix. So they're, they're easy to calculate in that way. Average rate is going to be the change in concentration over the whole reaction. So I started here with this much concentration. I ended there. And I can see it took that much time. So I'll do the same thing, the change in concentration over the change in time. And that'll give me the rate over the whole reaction. What's bad about the average is we can see that the rate's changing throughout. So the average doesn't accurately describe the reaction. It doesn't say how fast it's happening here or how slow, slowly it's happening there. Instantaneous rate is going to be the rate at any given time. So I've already plotted these concentrations versus time, and I've drawn a curve showing it how the concentration is changing. If I want the instantaneous rate, I pick any time, and then I just draw a tangent line, a line tangent to that point, so it's going to touch the curve in just one place. And then from that, I figure out the slope of that tangent line. 
So again, I go change in y over change in x, the, the rise over the run, and that'll give me the slope of this line, and I can figure out how much the concentration is changing per time.